Good afternoon. We will begin. <clears throat> For those of you who don't know what this is, I'm not going to take time this afternoon to explain because I do every week, but it will be the first question on the final exam. The final, the final exam will be uh, up on the website uh, sometime within the next couple of weeks. It's a real killer. It's a series of true and false questions. Uh, you can take it many times, and hopefully it's informative, and it's not intended to stress you. Because we keep telling that you didn't have to sit here and take notes through everything. You should just get excited by what you hear. So hopefully that's what the exam goes in. So those who, uh, in the book, have been to at least half of the sessions and who eventually pass this extremely difficult exam, uh, you'll get a certificate that you took the course, and uh, we hope you use it well. So what do these people have in common? Well, uh, you could do this for any kind of cancer. But I, sometimes it's interesting to look at the individuals who are involved, because many of them, because of their illness and sometimes their wealth, and usually, of course, their interest, have played a significant role in foundations, research, and uh, they haven't hid their illness. So all of these individuals had cancer of the bladder, and I believe they all died from it. Now, there's a long list of celebrities, but uh, they're just sort of, in a way, part of the iceberg. There are somewhere around 60, 70,000 people who have this disease, and about maybe 10, 15,000 will hear more actually die of it. So this is something to think about. In comparison to many other cancers, think lung, pancreas liver, kidney, uh, where symptomatology is usually relatively late in the stage of the disease. So in comparison with many other, not all, of course, cancers, bladder cancer would seem to be relatively easy to detect. If everybody tested their urine every day and looked for some red blood cells, that's probably as good as anything. Well, we'll hear whether it's as good as anything that can be offered. Now, once it's detected, it seems to me, as a liver doctor, diagnosing it isn't such a, a, a huge problem. It's not like trying to diagnose a pancreatic cancer or something like that, because you do a cystoscopy, and you can look and see and biopsy, and it's sort of there. You all know where the bladder is, I'm sure. Now, the problem is treating. So we'll hear about that. But given this, this triad there, what are the problems? Do we cure people? And what are the challenges? It's obviously not simple. And this is the basis of today's uh, discussion. And we're very fortunate to have two uh, NIH folks whose work touches on both sides of the bridge. Now, this is a little different. Every week when we have a session, the concept of the bridge is slightly different. In this case, <laughs> this makes it in a different category. And so what we're going to do, we're fortunate, is to have a presentation, which will be given uh, first by uh, Andrea Apollo. Uh, who graduated from my favorite medical school, the Albert Einstein College of Medicine, uh, took her intern residency at New York Hospital, uh, did a uh, oncology fellowship at Sloan Kettering, not shabby places, came here, uh, and she is an investigator in the genitourinary malignancy uh, branch of the National Cancer Institute. She's been particularly interested in 
uh, treatment, working on new treatments with collaborators, bridging in different directions to deal with some of the problems we're going to hear about. And uh, she's been very kind uh, to bring a patient of hers, whom we are very grateful for, who will briefly tell us all what her reaction to this disease is about, to sort of, as someone told me several years ago, put a human face on a disease. And then our second speaker is Luba Vartikovsky, uh, who's also a physician. Uh, Luba was born in Siberia, uh, started medical school there, finished in Columbia, then started in with hematology and oncology research at Salt Lake City, took a fellowship at the New England Medical Center in Boston in hematology oncology, and after that, spent several years in the laboratory of Lou Cantley, who, by the way, yesterday won the Gardner Award. <laughs> uh, now, this was the year that PI3 kinase was discovered, and Luba was in the right place at the right time, and she participated in that discovery and in the understanding of what PI3 kinase, how it's related to growth factor signaling, to oncogenesis, and other aspects. And she worked in that field until she came here to the NIH in roughly 2003 in the National Cancer Institute. And her work since then uh, has focused on drug development, uh, mechanisms of synergy and antagonism with combination of molecularly targeted therapies. And she's focused on drug resistance and also on stem cell uh, biology. And then, a few years ago, uh, she moved to the laboratory of receptor biology and gene expression, headed by Gordon Hager, which specializes in chromatin biology. And over the past couple of years, she has mastered techniques uh, of looking at uh, in-depth bioinformatic uh, information uh, of DNA's one accessible sites on chromatin and very advanced technology that gives uh, a landscape analysis of the accessible genome at any one time. It's really amazing. And she has collaborated with Andrea in studies of bladder cancer. So these are two very exciting dimensions on either side of the bridge. And we all look forward to hearing your talks. So would you like to interview? Yeah. Please sit down. Can everyone hear me? Yes, excellent. OK. Well, thank you for inviting me to be here today. Um, I am looking forward uh, to giving an overview of bladder cancer treatment and all the exciting things that are going on right now. But first, um, one of my patients was kind enough to offer to come and talk to you and discuss her journey through this experience. Um, and we're, we're going to be asking some questions, and she'll be telling you, you know, what her experience has been being diagnosed with bladder cancer, receiving the treatments that we give for bladder cancer, and how this has impacted her life. So we're going to um, stay private as to her name, so we're going to call her Miss MJ. Um, so Miss MJ, thank you for being here today. You're welcome. So why don't we start with from the beginning, and you can tell us what symptoms led you to the diagnosis of bladder cancer? It started uh, actually two years before I was diagnosed. I had bladder symptoms of pain and urgency, and um, it was subsequently thought to be interstitial cystitis, which is um, a disease that's sort of uh, diagnosed by symptoms alone and treated through diet, 
And once my diet, you know, I changed my diet and took out the so-called so irritants, I thought it was safe. Then I started bleeding, and that was it. So I had a cystoscopy done, and there were the tumors. So, so what happened after they found tumors in your bladder? What treatment did you receive? The first treatment that I received, and it's very common for bladder patients to receive, bladder cancer patients, is BCG, which is an attenuated live tuberculum bacterium. And it's um, instilled into the bladder uh, using a catheter one time a week for six weeks. And then you go home and you lay down and you turn side to side so that supposedly your bladder is covered. And then you have another uh, bladder biopsy, another cystoscopy to take a look and see if that's done the trick. Okay, so you received this treatment and um, you did well with it. No, actually, I did not. I Tell failed. Us about I it. failed that one. Okay. No, but in terms of your symptoms, how did you tolerate the treatment? I tolerated it fine. It didn't bother me at all. For some people, it does. Mm -hmm. But um, for six weeks, it was fine okay. for me. So it was um, not all that bothersome. So then, what happened after that? Well, like I said, I failed the treatment. Well, we say after... that the treatment failed you. Okay, the treatment <laughs> failed me for sure, and. I uh, went to Hopkins after that. I had another TUR done and another bladder biopsy, and it showed cancer in the bladder. And then my surgeon discussed options with me. Okay. Um, and then I'm sure that they discussed chemotherapy and removal of the bladder or maybe some more intravesicular therapy. Um, if I had shown any change at all, they might have continued. Mm -hmm. But it was felt to be, um, it was invasive into the second layer, the I lamina see. propria. Mm -hmm. So he didn't feel that the BCG was appropriate. And basically, we just discussed surgery. That would be my best option. And surgery was planned. There were several months while we decided for sure that, you know, I was scared to death, of course. And decided that surgery was good. And then I had my first PET scan right before surgery. And that's when it was discovered that the cancer was outside of the bladder. It was in my paraaortic and, you know, lower abdominal some pelvic lymph nodes. And suddenly my cancer or my, my surgery was canceled. And I met my oncologist. And we went to chemotherapy. Okay. And tell me about the chemotherapy. How was that, receiving the chemotherapy, the infusion? How did you tolerate that? Chemotherapy basically poisons the whole body. It's not an easy road to go. It, um, I, was, I was given um, six cycles over 18 weeks. Um, I had two transfusions. Several times, um, this in, some medication injected to help pick up your blood. My blood level steadily, you know, went down. I had intractable, a nausea. Um, it was a very difficult road. I was very weak. In fact, I had two dogs at home that I had to give to my friend who's a breeder with me. I couldn't even take care of my dogs. I couldn't even make dinner for myself. I, Chemo is a hard road, but and eventually they cut the chemo slightly short because my blood levels were so low. However, testing afterwards, it was found that it did take care of those cancers outside of the bladder. And my surgeon wanted to wait until my blood levels came up a little, and he thought I was strong enough for surgery, and then he did the cystoscopy. Mm -hmm. I mean the cystectomy. The cystectomy, yeah. Tell me about how, how that was going through the surgery, the radical cystectomy where they remove your bladder and they reconstruct your bladder out of bowel. Yes. They remove the whole bladder. They take a little piece of the bowel, so they've separated your bowel and now your, your intestines have been insulted as well. And they attach your ureters to the bowel and attach that to your skin. There are several diversions 
um, that people have that are different from this, but the kind I chose was the one, and it's called an ileal conduit. It's the one that you can recover from the fastest, and that was my most, at the top of my head. I wanted to know what would give me the best chance to go on with my life the fastest. And I found it to be no problem. The surgery, while extensive, is not that difficult to, you know, if you're strong and determined, you can get over the surgery and get back on your feet and get back to your life. And I've found that, you know, there's only a few things that I can't do as a result from it. How long did it take you to recover from the surgery? Probably a good four months to get my energy back. So it was, you know, you just have to keep at it. You have to be determined. It's like any surgery mm -hmm. that you have. And then you have to learn and sort of a new, your new normal. Right. And that's really not a problem either. Mm -hmm. So you were diagnosed with the bladder cancer, you had BCG therapy, you had the scrapings done, which we call TURBTs, transurethral bladder tumor resections. Then you went ahead and had chemotherapy because they found that the, that the disease was outside of the bladder, so essentially it was stage four at that point. How long ago was yes. that? Um, when, you, when you were diagnosed with the disease outside of the bladder on the PET scan? The second time. It was in, I'd had the surgery in December of uh, 2013, mm -hmm. and it was April of 2014 mm -hmm. after um, another PET scan. But before that, the, the first PET scan before the surgery... Was clear. Was clear. Was clear. But there was one that showed that you had the lymph node outside of the bladder. During surgery. But before surgery, too, correct? No. No, he wouldn't have done surgery, he told me. Okay. Unless we were clear. But before the chemotherapy. Yes. You did. Yes, yes. And when was that? So the, the first chemotherapy or the second? The first. The first. Before the first, yeah. Okay, before the first, that was, it started in uh, February of 20, 2014. It was my first chemo. December of mm -hmm. 2014 was when I ended up, finally had surgery. Right, right. So you started in February until December. Mm -hmm. So the point that I'm trying to make is, is that you were diagnosed with metastatic disease at that point. You had the chemotherapy, you responded to it, and then you had the surgery Correct. to kind of consolidate everything. Mm -hmm. And then what happened after that? In April, I had had another scan, and they found that there were, you know, more lymph nodes. Mm -hmm. that were, um, so I, I was stage four at that point. Mm -hmm. And I asked them, you know, so, okay, you know, I was feeling good. I would recovered from surgery, and I was, in fact, at a dog show when I heard this news. What do I do now? And found out nothing. There's nothing to do. You know, at stage four, metastatic, bladder cancer, there's essentially nothing to do. I went in and saw my oncologist, of course, and he said he would try the one, um, I have to back up just a moment, one of my side effects from chemo is neuropathy. I have it in both my hands and my feet, and that means my hands and feet are numb. It's called stocking and glove neuropathy, and it goes up my arm and up my legs. Um, luckily, I don't have the pain. I just have the numbness. Um, because of that, I could never receive the cisplatin part of the chemotherapy again. But he thought he would give me the Gemzar, just the one part of it, with no real hope that it would make a difference. But he would try it. So we were happy to have anything to do. And so started the Gemzar, which, looking halfway through, um, I think it was a CT, it looked like it was... It was helping. It was reducing the size of the lymph nodes. Um, and that was all fine until then my legs started swelling, and finally it had to be stopped because I had high fevers and ended up in the emergency room uh, due to the Gemzar. Okay. So then what happened? What, what led you here to the NIH? My wonderful doctor, Mario Eisenberger, <laughs> who... Um, 
knew of these studies and thought I might be a good candidate for them. Um, I'm lucky to not have any other medical problems other than sinus infections. And so he thought, you know, I might be a good candidate. And so I came and interviewed with you and your team. And tell us about Here your experience being at the <laughs> NIH as a patient. The NIH is a wonderful place. I mean, people are so supportive and caring. And I know that, you know, in all honesty, I am just another guinea pig. And it's just dumb luck that, well, more than that, that, you know, I might be doing better. And I feel wonderful. I think I look good. I have all my energy back. I'm able to exercise and swim and show dogs and do all the things that we like to do, with the one exception of ballroom dancing because I have the neuropathy and I can't feel my feet, really. But everybody here, from the valet to the phlebotomist to, of course, my wonderful doctors, has been so supportive and helpful, so communicative. You know, I'm never on the outside. I feel part of the whole thing. It's been wonderful. And that's wonderful to hear. So Miss MJ has been on our trial since October. She's currently on a checkpoint inhibitor study. And I'd like to report she's just doing fantastic. She had a complete response, essentially, of her disease um, and really has had very little symptoms uh, currently on the study. So we're very lucky that, you know, things are going really well. Um, I did want to ask you a couple of more questions. Um, uh, just um, tell me um, a little bit how, how this entire experience has impacted your life. Um, I think as a cancer patient, you're never now not a cancer patient. It's the first thing on your mind and the last thing. It affects everything. You're planning for any vacations, you know, should I really buy those shoes that are on sale for winter because, you know, will I make it till next winter? I mean, it just, it's not, it's, it's not like, you're not sad all the time. You're just impacted by it all the time. It just affects your life. Um, generally speaking, I'm a very positive person, and so anything it tries to impact, I try to overcome it. So that's how I handle it. But, you know, a cancer patient is a cancer patient, no matter what you have. So, blood, blood, this is the last question. Bladder cancer is one of the most common cancers uh, in the United States. And really, there's been a discordance among the research being done in bladder cancer compared to other common cancers. A lot of the people in this audience are young scientists. Do you have a message for them as a cancer patient? You. I do, I do. We absolutely need more support and, you know, more support financially, more research done. I found out that bladder cancer is in the top 10 of all cancers for both men and women. There's a 1 in 26 chance that a man in his lifetime will get bladder cancer. And that's horrible. And a 1 in 90 chance for a woman. And yet, we're like an orphan. You know, we need Angelina Jolie or somebody, you know, to champion our, our cancer. It's a very expensive cancer because we, are, we have to be monitored all the time. And these, you know, the tests that we have are not inexpensive. So it's a, it's, it's a, a very important cancer, and yet it has not had the attention that it needs. So if anybody just has an inkling that this might, it's not a very sexy cancer, that's for sure. But, you know, it could be a good one still. Well, thank you so much, Ms. MJ. Really appreciate having you. Everybody give her a round of applause. So I'll go ahead and start my overview of bladder cancer, and we named it a major disease because that's what it is. It's, it's such a common disease in the United States, yet it really doesn't get the funding that, like we talked about, and the attention or the awareness from the community that it probably should. So a couple of facts about bladder cancer or urothelial carcinoma. Last year, it affected 74 
5,600 new cases were diagnosed here in the United States, and there were 15,580 deaths attributed to bladder cancer. It's the fourth most common malignancy in men and the ninth most common malignancy in women. It is actually a disease of older patients. And as our, our population ages, there will be more patients diagnosed with bladder cancer because of that. The median age is 73. There's a three to one male to female ratio, and we don't really understand why. And there's a lot of research going into it right now to understand is this a hormonal impact? Why is this? It is a very chemosensitive disease, but the issue is that the duration of response is short. And the median survival for patients with metastatic disease is about 12 to 14 months. So we're currently in desperate need for very better therapies for this disease. So just to kind of put it in perspective, I made up a chart of the FDA-approved drugs in genital urinary tumors in the last nine years. Renal cell carcinoma has seen seven new drugs approved over the last uh, nine years by the FDA. Prostate cancer has seen also seven new drugs approved by the FDA for treatment of this disease. But bladder cancer hasn't seen a drug approved in for metastatic disease in over two decades. Valvuvacin was approved in 1998 for intravesicular therapy for non-muscle invasive disease, but that was again 17 years ago. So really, we need more research, and it is through our understanding of the VEGF pathway that we have been able to find better therapies for renal cell carcinoma, and our understanding of the androgen pathway that we have been able to find better treatments for prostate cancer, and we really need to understand what are the mechanisms that are governing the development of bladder cancer. So what causes bladder cancer? Well, we know that smoking is one of the most common risk factors for developing bladder cancer. And we used to think that this was more common in men than in women, but a recent report in JAMA showed that women have just as high a risk of developing bladder cancer from smoking. Occupational, ha uh, there are also occupational hazards such as aromatic amines, um, byproducts from the development of leather, rubber, and painting. Prior pelvic radiation, such as the radiation that um, men get for prostate cancer or women get for cervical cancer, prior cyclophosphamide therapy can also cause this. Schistosomiasis, which is a parasitic infection that is very common in the Nile River Valley in Africa, can actually cause bladder cancer too. It tends to cause a more squamous cell carcinoma type, but it can also cause a transitional cell carcinoma type. Chronic cystitis uh, can also, um, the patients that have indwelling catheters are, high, are at higher risk of developing bladder cancer. And some rare genetic uh, diseases such as HMPCC, which stands for hereditary non polyposis colon cancer, which pa patients with these mutations have a higher tendency of developing upper tract tumors. So the most common cell type of bladder cancer is transitional cell carcinoma, so we call it TCC, or urethelial carcinoma here in the United States. If we're talking about in Africa, it's about 50-50. In the, um, because of the schistosomiasis. But as more people are smoking, it's actually tra transitional cell carcinoma is becoming more common. Uh, squamous cell carcinoma makes up a small portion of bladder cancers. Adenocarcinoma also. We, we, but here at the NIH, we see a large proportion of patients with these rare histologies. My fellows think that small cell carcinoma is extremely common, yet it makes up less than 1% of all bladder cancers because we see rare diseases here in, in, at the NIH. So when I say bladder cancer, I mean cancer anywhere in the urinary tract. So anywhere where there are ur urinary cells, you can develop bladder cancer. So in the renal pelvis, in the ureter, in the bladder, and in part of the urethra. And whether you develop the tumor here or you develop the tumor in the actual bladder proper, the natural history in the metastatic setting is very similar. So we treat these patients in the metastatic setting equal to the same. So in terms of one of the most important uh, factors uh, in, in, in staging bladder cancer is the depth of invasion. So their bladder cancer um, can develop as flat lesions called carcinoma in situ. And although these don't look very dangerous, they actually are pretty dangerous. These are high-grade lesions, and they're really hard to see with a cystoscope. So you, you put a cystoscope up in the bladder, and they're really hard to see because basically it just looks like a little area of redness. Um, but these areas can progress into more invasive uh, 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 tumors. There's also the TA, which are non-invasive tumors that develop in the surface of the bladder. Uh, T1A, uh, which is what we heard our patient had um, initially, which is invasion into the first layer of the bladder. And then there's invasion into the muscle layer, invasion into the fat, and invasion into the contiguous organs, T2, T3, and T4. And as medical oncologists, I tend to see the T2, T3, and T4 lesions um, 
in initially a presentation. Bladder cancer is very different than other cancers is that if you have lymph node involvement, you actually have metastatic disease. You don't see that for, for example, testicular cancer, where you can have, you can have brain mets, liver mets, and still be stage three. For bladder cancer, because it's such an aggressive disease, as soon as you have lymph node involvement, anything outside of the bladder, it's considered stage four, and it's managed as, as stage four. So bladder cancer presents generally as blood in the urine. Gross hematuria is the most common presentation. You can also get irritative symptoms. Uh, some people get um, uh, s s um, trace uh, um, uh, blood that you can find um, uh, just from going into the doctor. Uh, just call it microscopic hematuria. And when they're advanced disease, then you can have urinary obstruction um, that uh, involves organs, and you can get pain and discomfort. So there's essentially, we, we categorize patients into three categories when they initially get diagnosed. Non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, muscle invasive bladder cancer, and metastatic bladder cancer. And I'll start off talking about non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, but this is really handled by the urologist. So the patient has blood in the urine, they go and they see their urologist, um, they, they go and they take a look inside of the bladder and see what is the depth of invasion and then they get a scraping, which we call a TURBT, a transurethral bladder tumor resection, and some patients will and will not get uh, intravesicular therapy, so therapy inside of the, inside of the bladder. So this is uh, what a cystoscope looks like. This is a flex six, uh, cystoscopy that it's, it's got a little camera, and you take a look inside the bladder, and this is what a bladder tumor looks like. It looks actually like a flower. Um, and, and the urologist will go ahead and scrape that um, under an exam under anesthesia, and this is what that looks like. They go ahead and they, they try to get as much as possible, trying to get the muscle so they can assess the depth of invasion. And then depending on the stage, you can risk patients, you can risk stratify patients. If they're low grade, then you, know, then, then you can just do the scraping and just follow the patients. If they're intermediate grade, then you can discuss whether they need some intravesical therapy. And if they're high grade, you definitely give intravesical therapy to these patients. Um, not all patients need intravesical therapy. Generally, it's patients that have a lot of recurrences, that the cancer keeps on coming back. Bladder cancer is one of the most expensive cancers in the United States because of the surveillance. We have to follow these patients every three months with cystoscopes, which are not that comfortable and are very expensive. Um, so because of that, because of the close follow-up, then um, it becomes a very expensive cancer. And um, so if there's recurrences, then you give intravesicular therapy here. Um, if there's a large tumor, if there's invasion into the first layer, like our patient had, then you go ahead and you give um, some therapy. And BCG is the most common therapy uh, that, that uh, is given to patients, and it's the one that's actually the most effective. Other intravesical therapies, uh, such as chemotherapy, are also given too, um, generally in the second line or for less uh, aggressive tumors. So that's a great question. Um, you know, I think it was actually discovered accidentally. You know, it was like, well, you know, let's let's see if we can cause an irritation in the bladder and 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 therefore kind of kill the tumor by direct contact. And what it actually does is it it pulls together a, a bunch of um, immune infiltrates to kind of cause like an immune reaction. It's a nonspecific inflammatory reaction, and that's a theory of how BCG works. But the true mechanism you know, is still unclear. So moving on from non-muscle invasive bladder cancer to muscle invasive bladder cancer, it used to be that muscle invasive bladder cancer was just essentially managed by the urologist. You have invasion into the muscle, we take, the, we take it out. Um, but we've noted more and more, just from, you know, following patients for a long time, that this is actually a systemic disease. And 50% uh, of the patients that have this radical surgery where the bladder is removed uh, and they have reconstruction of their bladder still have their cancer come back. So the question is, how do we do better? So large studies have shown that given systemic chemotherapy before removing the bladder um, is actually very helpful. Uh, and more and more, uh, the other methods um, for, to manage uh, muscle invasive bladder cancer have been looked at, such as trimodality therapy where you actually try to keep the bladder. You radiate the bladder 
uh, and you give it along with chemotherapy and you do the maximum scraping that you can, the maximum TURBT. So that is, that is also an option here, the trimodality uh, therapy to spare the bladder um, that is not practiced as much here in the United States. It is a little bit. It's mostly, it's practiced a lot in Europe, but I think it's um, more and more patients are demanding it now because Patients want to keep their bladder. They're fond of their bladder, and if it's and if it's a possibility, um, then it's then it's something that uh, we're doing more and more research, and more centers are becoming comfortable uh, with giving and offering trimodality therapy for patients with muscle invasive disease. So, radical cystectomy is a big surgery. It includes you remove the bladder, you remove the lymph nodes, you remove the distal ureter. In men, you remove the prostate gland, the seminal vesicle, the proximal urethra. In women, you remove the urethra, the uterus, the fallopian tube, the anterior vaginal wall, and the surrounding fascia. It's a big surgery. And then you do the reconstruction. Then you reconstruct. And there's a couple of uh, urinary diversions that, that, are, that are available, and I'm only mentioning three of them, which is an ileal conduit. Um, that's when uh, it, you actually just um, put a part of the bowel and you connect it to directly into the skin and the urine just continuously flows from the kidney into the bowel out into a bag. So that's the ileal conduit. That's the easiest one to do that has less complications. Um, there's also a continent cutaneous reservoir or the Indiana pouch where a pouch is made with a little opening on top of the belly button and the patient catheterizes themselves. Um, and then there's uh, the neobladder which uh, a lot of people like and a lot of people would prefer, but not all patients can get. It's a little bit more high maintenance. Um, it, it, it really requires um, a lot from the patient um, and their willingness to catheterize because it may not work well all the time, where a pouch is made and it's actually connected to the native urethra. So this is if there's no disease in the urethra and the surgeon kind of makes this call in the middle of, uh, you know, during the operation, make sure that they don't find anything in the urethra. And then they connect this bowel pouch that they made into the urethra and the patient voids through the urethra. So they void normally and they learn that they time it and they void at a certain time. Um, so those are the common um, diversions that are done. Now this is just a graph showing uh, that chemotherapy before surgery actually improves survival. And when they actually looked at why is the survival being improved in patients that are receiving chemotherapy, it's the patients that had their tumor downstage and respond and had their tumors go from a T2 from a muscle invasive to a non-muscle invasive are the ones that did the best in terms of response to the therapy. So moving on to metastatic bladder cancer. So the metastatic bladder cancer is managed by the medical oncologist. That's me. And what are the treatments for bladder cancer? Essentially, it's not curable. And the treatment is chemotherapy. And if the patient has good kidney function, which a lot of times they don't, uh, but if they have good kidney functions, we can do a cis-platinum-based combination. If they don't, we, we do a non-cis-platinum-based combination. And that's it. If you already got chemotherapy like our patient did, she already got chemotherapy before the surgery, which was appropriate, um, then, and then the cancer comes back, then you're kind of left with, what do we do next? And that's where we need more research. That's where there's been... A lot, I have, I have some updates to give you, um, and there's a lot of exciting things coming up um, that I think that, you know, will change our paradigm and the way that we treat bladder cancer in the next 10 years. So where does uh, the chemotherapy studies come from? MVAC was developed uh, uh, back in the late 80s and 90s where they compared, MVAC is a four-drug chemotherapy regimen, methotrexate, vimblastin, adromycin, and cisplatinum. So basically throwing the kitchen sink in there. Um, and comparing it to regular cisplatinum, is it any better? Yes, there's, there was an improvement in survival in, in these uh, first uh, initial studies. The four drug combination was compared to other uh, cisplatinum combinations, and again, there was a survival benefit. Then uh, there was a large study, a phase three study, that compared a two drug combination to the four drug combination that had become the standard, you know, just to see if two drugs is as good as the four drugs, and it actually found that the true drugs were as good as the four drugs with similar overall survival, similar response rates, and um, similar, uh, similar response rates and similar time to progression. So essentially the two drug regimen became a standard of care, and that's what our patient received, is a two drug regimen. A lot less toxicity, so that was really important. The MVAC regimen has a lot of toxicity, the nausea and the vomiting and 
the fatigue and the neutropenia and the fevers and the hospitalizations, even septic deaths um, happened with MVAC. But GEMSYS, the, the two drug combination, is a lot easier to give. And even that being said, our patient shared with you her experience of getting the GEMSYS and how hard it was for her. So moving on to happier thoughts, uh, what is new uh, is in, in systemic therapies in urothelial carcinoma? Well, we are currently in the beginning of an immunotherapy revolution in oncology. Immune checkpoint therapy has demonstrated significant clinical activity in multiple solid tumors. And we have found that pd one is highly expressed in urothelial carcinoma, and it correlates with pathologic stage. So the higher the pathologic stage, so T2, T3, have higher expressions of pd one uh, and, uh, and it correlates with overall survival. So let's talk about the PD-1 pathway. PD-1 is a negative co-stimulatory receptor expressed primarily on activated T cells. Binding of the PD-1 to its ligand, PDL1 or PDL2, inhibits effector T cells. An expression of PDL1 on tumor cells and macrophages can suppress immune surveillance and permit neoplastic growth. So over the last year, this has just happened in the last year, there were two studies that were reported of checkpoint inhibitors in bladder cancer patients. And this, these are waterfall plots. And each bar represents one patient. And this is the, the longer the bar goes down, that means that the tumor shrank by a certain percentage by standard radiologic criteria. So this is tumor shrinking. So tumor shrinking using an immunotherapy in the metastatic setting in bladder cancer is novel. That is a big deal because nothing works. So the fact that we got this tumor shrinking in patients with advanced disease that were, that were refractory to standard chemotherapy is very exciting. And two drugs, small studies, um, were tested. One is MPDL3280. Um, and that was tested in a, in a group of 68 patients. And this is um, pembrolizumab, which was studied uh, in a group of 30 patients. So again, small studies. But the excitement is immense right now in the bladder cancer world because that means these drugs work. And my patient that we saw today is on one of these drugs, not one of these two, another company. And she has had a remarkable response in her tumor. Six months really very little side effects. And that is the excitement about these drugs. It's not so much the percentage of people that respond, because actually not everybody responds. It's only about a quarter uh, right now. And I, I don't know if I have a slide. I don't think I have a slide of the, the percentage of people that respond. But it's about 25% of the patients in an enriched population that have a high expression of the pd one uh, are responding. Uh, so it's not a high number of patients that respond, but the excitement is that the toxicity is low and that the, the response durations seem to be long. And that was one of the problems with chemotherapy. You get these great responses, but the cancer comes back in seven months. And if you give it the second line setting, the cancer comes back in four months. So a lot of these therapies um, right now, uh, they, they're reporting patients 10, one year, 10 months, one year out, and they're still responding. So that's really exciting. So because of that right now, there are many clinical trials that are ongoing using checkpoint inhibitor either alone or in combination with other agents, including a two phase three studies. This is unheard of in bladder cancer. Nobody ever wanted to do a phase three study in bladder cancer. Two phase three studies uh, study in patients with advanced disease uh, studying uh, the agents that we just mentioned in the smaller studies. Uh, now they're being studied in patients that are not cisplatinum eligible and in even moving it along into the earlier setting, like muscle invasive and non-muscle invasive disease, alone or in combination. For example, even in non-muscle invasive disease, it's being combined with BCG to see if we can enhance the, the immune response. And there is a thought that perhaps we can improve these agents and improve the response if we combine them. And there's been a lot of preclinical data showing that immunotherapy's response can be enhanced if you add a vaccine, if you add another Another checkpoint inhibitor like CTLA-4, there's been uh, studies in melanoma comparing CTLA-4 inhibitors with the pd one inhibitors showing actually additive effects. So that's exciting. Um, or adoptive cell transfer, uh, radiation given at a certain dose, chemotherapy, and tyrosine kinase inhibitors. And we have a trial here with cabozantinib, which is a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And we did uh, some correlative work, and we found that there's changes in the immune infiltrate of cells in bladder cancer patients that are treated with cabozantinib. And when we treated them, 
with cabalzantinib. It decreased the Tregs, um, increased PD-1 expression in the Tregs, and decreased CTLA-4 expression. So we hypothesized, and this was presented, I presented this at ASCO last year because it's very exciting, that cabalzantinib has immunomodulatory properties that may counter act tumor-induced immunosuppression, providing a rationale for combining cabalzantinib with immunotherapeutic strategies. And that's one of, and cabalzantinib works. We, we're, we're having, um, we have seen some very nice clinical responses of this agent in patients here um, that are receiving this drug uh, with some nice regression. These are tumors here that are essentially cavitating. So we have seen this in several of our patients. So perhaps if we combine two active agents together, we may get an additive or even synergistic effect. So the theory is that potentially increasing the T cell infiltration into the tumors, and may, many of these therapies may prime the tumor for a better response to checkpoint inhibitor. But we have to, of course, worry about toxicity. So I'm just going to uh, transition this talk um, a little bit on genomics uh, just to kind of lead in to my next speaker and kind of talk about where are we in genomics in bladder cancer. And I have to say, over the last decade, many, many targeted agents have been studied in bladder cancer with disappointing results. Very, very low response rates, zero response rates, 3%, um, or, and, and really no change in overall survival. And these agents are active in other solid tumors, but they haven't shown activity in bladder cancer. And we rationalize that Perhaps it's not that these agents aren't active in bladder cancer, but we're just not stratifying the patients correctly. We tend to treat patients by histologic pathology, small cell patients, melanoma patients, treating them, and, you know, and then treating them with a targeted agent. But perhaps we should really be stratifying patients by genomic pathology and look at what alterations are being activated in these patients, look at their genetic mutations, and treat them according to those alterations that they have. And one of the biggest efforts so far that, that have been done in bladder cancer to try to understand uh, the genomic pathology in bladder cancer patients is it's through the TCGA. And the TCGA reported the first bladder cancer paper last year in January, uh, found, finding, and they reported um, on 32 commonly mutated genes. They, they studied 131 muscle-invasive bladder cancer patients, and they reported 32 most commonly mutated genes. Many of these genes, oh, let me it's, it, the the great thing about it is that 69% of the tumors that they studied harbored potential therapeutic targets. So that's important. And 76% of the tumors had an inactivated mutation in the chromatin regulatory genes. So these epigenetic alterations also suggest new possibilities for bladder cancer treatment. Um, many of these uh, genes have potential pathways that can be targeted, like PIK3CA, FGFR3, and TSC1. And many are already in development in clinical trials. So that's really exciting. And one of the new ways that we are developing clinical trials in bladder cancer is kind of, you know, doing a, a mutational analysis and treating patients based on their mutations. And one of the reasons that we specifically wanted to do it in bladder cancer and not take part of a lot of these, like, basket trials that are ongoing right now is because bladder cancer is an orphan. And it'll get pushed out by lung cancer. It'll get pushed out. And you, you'll, you'll have this huge study of, like, 1,000 patients, and there'll be, like, 10 bladder cancer patients in there. So we wanted to do our own study, um, and this is an effort that is currently um, being initiated by the cooperative groups where they will actually mute, uh, um, uh, look for the mutations, uh, screen these patients um, for molecular, do a molecular screening, and depending on their alterations, treat them with the corresponding inhibitor. Um, we also have um, a study that is currently ongoing right now using a different method, using the Coxin uh, method, um, which uses molecular profiles of drug sensitivities based on data derived from NCI 60 cell lines um, to predict tumor sensitivity of, of, of the tumor, whether it's going to respond to chemotherapy or not. And this is a study of patients with muscle invasive disease where they're going to be randomized to receive GEMSYS, the doublet, or dosense MVAC, the four drug regimen, and see whether Coxin can actually predict uh, which, which of these drugs it would have responded best to in terms of downstaging of the tumor. So this study is ongoing right now through the cooperative groups, and we're about to open a study here at the NCI, which I'm going to lead, where we're going to use the coxin in real time. So we're going we're to biopsy the tumor of the patient, run it through the molecular profile, then get a coxin score, and we'll get a coxin score for the 76 FDA-approved drugs and see where they rank in the tumor in terms of sensitive and resistant and go through a molecular tumor board to decide on the next best treatment for the patient based on their tumor sensitivities derived from the coxin score. So again, very exciting. You can think of it as precision medicine. 
So we have a trial, we have a, a, a broader team here at the NCI that is very active uh, with the help of my urologist, which I saw before, uh, Dr. Agarwal. I don't know if he's here, if he's still here, he might have left, he may have just left. Um, so uh, it, 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 right now we have many clinical trials that are either um, finished, um, ongoing, or in development in not only metastatic disease, but also in muscle invasive and in non-muscle invasive disease. So I think we've come a long way, including genomic medicine and immunotherapy. I think we've come a long way and we still have a long way to go, but I think it's a really exciting time to be doing research in bladder cancer right now. So with that, I wanted to say thank you for your attention. <laughs> We have time for a few questions, and we would like you to be brief and talk into the microphone so that people who are listening can hear the question as well as the answer. Thank you so much, and thanks to your patient also for coming out. Really appreciate it. It makes a difference. Um, in terms of uh, looking at social demographics or, or uh, race and ethnicity, any changes or differences you see, or haven't we seen enough? Do you have any comments on it? We have a little bit of data, not a lot. It seems that bladder cancer affects mostly white men, but in women that are diagnosed, they tend to be diagnosed at higher stage. They tend to be diagnosed later. So there's a question, is this the biology of the disease, or is it just the diagnosis, how it's just delayed because they don't go straight to a urologist, they'll go to a GYN or to an internist. So that's a lot of question. Um, African American men tend to do poorly, as they do in other diseases too. And is it is it social? Is it a social issue? Is it availability of care? I think we're still trying to find out. But there hasn't been any studies looking at the biology and other demographics. So that would be very interesting. Well, not, none that I'm aware. Of. I'm sure there must be something out there looking at uh, maybe SEER data, but not nothing that I'm okay. aware. Of. But that's a great question. Go ahead. Um, TCGA has classification for bladder tumors as papillary and non-papillary, and it doesn't really co correlate with tumor stage and grade. Could you comment on this and the significance, clinical significance of this classification, and which one is you think is more um, important? Thank you. So, so the question is, what is the difference between papillary and non-papillary? Because the TCGA tends to classify these as papillary and non-papillary. Papillary essentially it just means that the tumor comes with a stalk, so it's easier to resect. They tend to be earlier stages tumors, so the TA tumors tend to be um, uh, um, papillary. However, these, the, the tumors, all of the tumors in the TCJ are all T2. So, so you know, what is, what is the difference? Papillary just, they're, that they're, they, they tend to grow as papillary more commonly, and there's non-papillary includes C cell masses, which are actually, really don't have a neck and are kind of or to resect when you're trying to resect it because they're just kind of ingrown into the lining of the bladder. And in terms of whether one is more aggressive than the other, we have a theory that non-papillary tend to be a little bit more aggressive. Uh, very nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, how well documented is the, is the local treatment, the first treatment that was described by the patient? How, how, how well documented? How many, st I mean, blended control trials? Is it oh, well yes, documented? BCG therapy. Is yes. that what you, you mean? Yes. Yeah. So BCG therapy has been around since 1976 was, was the first time uh, that it was studied. And um, it, it has shown that it actually reduces recurrences um, and uh, that it can get rid of non-invasive tumors. It only works for non-invasive tumors. When this, once the tumor becomes invasive into the muscle, it doesn't work anymore. And it's actually been compared to other chemotherapies to see, you know, can we do better than BCG? And all studies so far show that BCG is better than other, other chemotherapies that are given in, inside the bladder. Okay. So, Andrea, uh, have people been saving samples from surgery? Not now, but during all these controlled trials and so forth for genomic studies? Not enough. That's and, this is, and, and, you know, like you said, bladder cancer is so accessible because yeah. you can actually get tumor. But there, there really hasn't been 
um, we don't have the tissue banks that other tumors do uh, have. Because you know what now happened. we are. You're now we are. Now yeah. with the, the TCGA and with tumor banks that are becoming available, we are trying to save more and more. And people, when they do clinical trials, they understand how important it is to get tumor from patients. But we don't have like a, a suppository where you know where, where where all of this a repository where all of these is available. All right. Does Hunter's ulcers or lesions in the bladder predispose bladder cancer? Do having ulcers? H-U-N-N-E-R apostrophe S. So, um, not really. I mean, inflammation does. You know, having having just you know just those irritative. No, not not so much. But it does require just surveillance. You know, just to make sure. But those aren't cancerous. Yeah. Okay. I think we'll hold any questions for after Dr. Vardakovsky is completed. Thank you. Uh, well, in the next 20 minutes, we're going to dwell into uh, the new area of uh, the molecular biology of bladder cancer and what we know, what we don't, and what we need to know to really improve our therapies. And from my point of view as an oncologist, but now involved in basic science research, this is really a very, very important question and a good tumor to look at because there's Pretty much nothing is known. So here we go. So we're going to look over analysis of the molecular alteration in many tumor types. And just to have an idea, what is unique about bladder? Why we know so much about other tumors and not as much about bladder? And also, um, what are the genomic epigenetic chromatin modifications in that tumor? What is known and what is new? So I think. 20 minutes may not be enough. I'll try to go through the slides and some review of literature for you, and then um, welcome some questions. So what is the genomic landscape of uh, bladder cancer? First, let's look at other cancers and see where we stand in bladder cancer compared to other tumors. So TCGA, which is a um, group or consortium uh, made out of that pretty quickly on this one. Um, a multiple um, institution was established in 2005 with an idea that will be a collective um, group connecting uh, different disciplines and mostly look at genomics and some of the proteomics, some of the other molecular uh, targets in different cancer types. And so I'm going to review some of their latest pu publication about 12 cancer types. And uh, there is a review how to use that for USG um, cancer genome browser. So this is a very important figure in that paper, which gives you a really good idea of comparing different tumor types. And we have acute myelogenous leukemia, breast, um, ovarian, and the other tumors. So this is kidney and renal, urotelial cancer, glioblastoma multiformia, common brain tumor, colorectal and, and uh, rectal cancer, uh, head and neck, and bladder cancer, and two types of lung cancer, adenocarcinoma and small cell. So in this analysis, we're looking at the number of mutations per megabase of DNA. There's how many mutations there are in each tumor type. And as you see, that the lowest is AML. And bladder cancer is with the group of lung, which has the highest number per megabase. So here is your AML is the lowest mutation, maybe one per megabase. Then you have this, the highest number with lung cancer and bladder. And just think about it. It's what we breathe and exposed to various carcinogen in the air. And what bladder accumulates, which is our urine, which we eat and we drink, and that is a source probably of carcinogen. Interestingly, that uterine uh, cancer and colorectal and uh, uh, rectal cancer have a very high number of different clusters. They have 
number of patients who have, where they have hypermutative uh, phenotype, which means they have more than 150 mutations they could have above um, any other tumors. And that's, that's another issue all by itself. And interestingly, um, that we can see that lung cancer has an increased um, G, C to G transversions. And I'm going to go a little bit over that, because if you look at the bottom of this slide, there is very important information. In blue, there is this transition between cytosine to thymidine. And um, the uh, green one is this C2G transversion. And for those of us who are not molecular biologists by birth, I am not, and my scientific birth, I'm going to put this slide just to remind you what I mean. In order to acquire a transition between cytosine and thymidine, all that's required is put an amino group onto the, um, the molecule. And then once you're in a thymidine mode, there's no way to get it back. Our enzymes are not really capable of putting, of making it transition back. So this is a very common um, transition where methylation of the cytosine is a normal process of, of the DNA um, methylation, and yet it may lead to permanent mutations. Most of them are silent because the body tolerates, and our genomic material tolerates this type of transition. Um, but some of them are lead to permanent change of both truncations of um, acquisition of stop codons and really um, serious mutations affecting genes. In terms of transversion, you have to go from one ring to a two ring molecule, and that is more common occurring with severe oxidative stress and other injury. So we have abnormal methylation. I'm just going to set your mind on that in, in terms of bladder cancer. And in bladder cancer, we actually have both. There's a significant number of, trans, uh, of transversions as well as uh, methylation-induced transitions in, in, in the bladder. So both oxidase stress and DNA methylation play a role in that tumor in general. So this is another way to look at it, and it is looking at the number of non-simonimous mutations in tumors and looking at 127 most commonly mutated genes in all of those 12 cancers. So out of that, you can take a look that bladder cancer and uterine cancer contain the highest number of these mutations per tumor. So in general, we have um, two to six mutations per tumor, a range, but bladder and uterine have the highest. So here again, we're dealing with an organ that is exposed by its own location in, uh, to a number of uh, carcinogen and injuries. So bladder, as um, Andrea placed it very nicely, is a, a rather simple organ. It's a, it's a conduit to contain our urine. However, if we look a little closer, it's not so simple. It has a transition between the bladder into the urethra, and this is a little bit backwards because the, uh, the two ureters coming from the top and the bottom. But here you have um, a really very nice view of what the muscle layer is and multiple cells that contain the connective tissue, the layer of the epithelium, and then the muscle layer underneath the bladder. And in terms of progression of the, uh, I'm not going to dwell on this slide because Andrew explained it very nicely, but Somewhere between stage one and stage two, the invasion into these deeper layers really determines the tumor outcome and response to therapy. So somewhere between the low grade and high grade, and where is that transition? And as we're looking at molecular components and molecular mutations within those tumors, you will see that there isn't much difference, and that is a continuum. So let's take a look at what we have. We traditionally thought that the non-muscle invasive have near deployment karyotype, which is double the number of chromosomes, normal, and very few genomic mutations. And the muscle invasive uh, bladder cancer has everything. They have 
the chromosome number changes, which is called anofluidy. They're either too few or too, um, too more than necessary for normal human karyotype. Alteration, translocation, and even chromotrypsis, which is this explosion of chromosome by the time they come together, there are multiple chromosomal rearrangements. There's a number of chromosomes that are not right, and so on, if the cell survives. And then uh, also repairs in uh, DNA and inactivating mutations in DNA repair genes, in DNA damage checkpoint control, which Andrea pointed out, and also in epigenetic chromatin modifiers. And that's a very large group of genes. We'll see that recurrently in the more recent uh, genomic studies. So what are we missing? How do we study bladder cancer? This seemed to be so complex and so beyond of what we actually thought about it before and had as a model, say, breast cancer, BRCA, HER2. Um, we had with uh, chronic malogenous leukemia, single genes, targeted therapies. We're not there in bladder cancer. Just think through my entire talk that we're talking about at least five to seven mutations, her tumor, her patient, her megabase of genome. It's not one and it's not two. So how about microarray? This is, you know, we have done some progress in microarray technology. We have seen a lot of tumors having a lot of help with microarray. Well, there was a very nice study, many studies in bladder, and one of them showed that there is a 20 um, microarray, 20 genes, that are, seem to correlate with survival, seem to correlate with response to therapy. That looked really good. That was in 2011. However, a larger study, no effect and no correlation. So we couldn't rely on microarray analysis either. So there is a number of papers came along in the last literally two years showing that urotelial cancer has something very different. And what we have is for a tremendous nucleotide heterogeneity. We have involvement of chromatin remodeling genes, and we have frequent modifications on some of the genes that we have not suspected to be um, mutated in other tumors. So somewhat unique. So I'm going to review for you the TCGA study that showed, um, it's rather one of the largest studies showing 131 patients that have not been treated with bladder cancer. And it's a pretty extensive study with, um, they found 39,000 somatic mutations in these tumors. And with average of 302 total mutations, um, it's a little less than long and melanoma, which considered to be the most hypermutable type of tumors, but it's pretty large, and also alterations in other um, genetic material. So this is a very important slide, and I'll walk through it a little slower. Um, this is a slide that shows that all of these tumors that we looked, if you look at smoking, you look at stage, and you look at gender, they're all over the place. There is no correlation looking at this large number of patients by genomic signature that it would assign that actually smoking is a risk factor, not anymore. And one of the genes that they mutated most frequently is P53. And P53, oxidative stress, we know a lot about P53 is one of those, it was a molecule of the year in 1989, I think. Um, and it is, again, that with RB1 is one of the most commonly mutated genes in bladder cancer. Again, spread out between few different groups. However, this study tried to correlate the mutational analysis with, by itself, without putting it together with smoking and gender and other, and other sections. And it kind of divided itself into three groups. So the red group, it was called, so to speak, focally amplified. And it enriched in focal somatic copy number alteration, has a lot of either onoploidy or gene amplification. 
um, location, but it also includes chromatin remodelers. And here is the interesting thing. These are the genes as a group, is the largest gene group within these tumors, in all of them. And it's in very much enriched in each one of these three groups. I just want to, to keep that in mind. The blue part is a group that is enriched with FGF3 mutation. So FGF3, perhaps this is a re mutation that makes FGF receptor superactive. And there is a specific inhibitor. And Andre pointed out that there is a number of clinical trials that probably will be targeting uh, this about anywhere 15% of those tumors. And they also CDK and 2A deficient, so they might be amenable to checkpoint um, inhibitors. And the green one is this uh, P53 cell cycle mutant or B mutant group. But again, look at this. This is not even mentioned in the TCGA study because they really don't know what to do with it. And I'll go back um, to that a little later. This is another study that also showed that the um, genomic landscape is somewhat similar. This is uh, actually comparing superficial and invasive tumor. And as you see, no difference. We have superficial and invasive. Maybe this is a little bit more of invasive tumor. But look at superficial tumors, spikal. They are salt and pepper right all over the genomic landscape. And here um, in this study as well, we can see that KDM6A, Arida, EP300, as well as the, uh, these genes are part of the chromatin remodeling, along with the mostly known gene, P53RB, RAS family in FGF3. So similar data, very, um, very much similar. So the other way to look at it, are they mutually exclusive? What are this, this chromatin remodelers? Are they on the same? level with PI3 kinase mutations, with RAS mutation, MYC, and it looks like they are because they are mutually ex exclusive uh, with RB, with MYC, and PI3 kinase mutations. In other words, if they are there, there's no need for PI3 kinase mutation. My old friend, and certainly a very important part of my career, but also um, combination of Aurida and RB1, quite surprising that you'd can have the similar weight of um, genomic landscape. And this is quite well separated between uh, those two groups. Overall, we can see that P53 and MDM mutations are in about 80%, as an Andrea pointed out as well. The um, this chromatin remodelers of MLL12 and KDM are in about 70% of tumors. So that was really surprising. We have never previously addressed chromatin remodelers as a target for therapy. How are we going to do it? How are we going to study chromatin remodeling as a target for tumors? So this is uh, one of the, um, the slides just to show you that the mutations in these genes, one of them is the BRCA-associated uh, protein, um, ARIDA1, KDM6A, Stack 2 is in multiple sites within the, within the gene. It isn't like one spot that all the mutations occur. They occur all over the gene, including some of the truncated mutations. So there are, there are various sites that inactivate the gene in many ways that make it um, participate in the genomic uh, rearrangement. And here is KDM6A. So there's a lot of attention on KDM6A. And a group in our um, institute in, at NCI, uh, led by Maya Nickerson, have looked at KDM6A specifically. Can KDM6A be a really a tumor suppressor gene? Is it really inactivating that gene helps the bladder cancer to develop? Um, well, first I'm going to look at, give you a slide of, of this, all the complexity of chromatin remodelers. And so there is a number of genes that participate in uh, chromatin modification. And they have to do with DNA methylation, histone modification, and chromatin remodeler complex, and include long encoding RNAs and microRNAs. The way I want you to think about it is that DNA never exists naked. 
If it exists naked, it will be broken. It's a string highly protected and highly wrapped up along the histone. So in order to histones open up a little bit so proteins can come up and initiate transcription of genes, they have to be unprotected. But at the same time, some proteins are always going to be bound to that DNA just to have it never naked. So otherwise, it will be broken. So we have these, um, oops, these proteins that I um, have mentioned to you, MLL, KDM, as well as TET2 and EP300, which is CBEBP complex, ARIDA, they are all complex in modifying epigenetically the actual chromatin structure. And uh, especially this complex of SWIFT SNF, which is, contains at any point anywhere from 40 to 60 proteins, is the one that moves the histones around, pushes it to the left, pushes it to the right, trying to make space for other proteins to come up, for Pol to come up to initiate transcription to modify the uh, transcriptional uh, events. The other concept that you should think about it is that all of these modifications occur way before we see RNA being made. And most of them will not lead to RNA transcription or make any other RNA. It will just modify so the complexes can be assembled or reassembled. And at some place along the DNA string, there will be a RNA made. So we think about these processes as occurring before RNA is made, certainly way before any protein is ever made. So KDM6A is a um, um, histone 3 k 27 dimethylase, an important marker of initiation of gene transcription. And the, these investigators took two cell lines. One is, was a positive for expression of KDM6. And the other one was negative. And we play our usual game. We reconstitute it and look at the, um, the um, biological behavior of that cell. And here is the results of when you're taking a cell line and uh, the one that has normal expression and knock down the KDM6A. Now suddenly this cell grow and um, have much more number of colonies in agar. That means a um, Anchorage independent growth is increased. And when you take a cell line that didn't have it, which is T24T, the growth is suppressed. So if you overexpress it in a cell line that, that didn't um, express it normally, the growth is suppressed. So how about proliferation in vitro? Nope. There's no change. They grow at the same rate, whether you put it in or put it out. But however, when you knock out the cell line that has normally KDM6A, but you knock it out, you no longer can grow tumors in mice. So for really clear um, separation between tumor cells that normally grow in mice and these tumor cells that lack KDM6A. But this experiments really show that KDM6A is true tumor suppressor. They have not been done any of the study or the list of the other uh, commenting models that I showed you before. So summary of part one of my talk, uh, most frequent mutations in bladder cancer are not the driver mutations that we understand, that we can target with drugs that we know that work as a single drug therapy. Microanalysis has not produced substantial results that we can do any for diagnosis or therapy. Muscle invasive bladder cancer have more than five mutations per tumor, and sometimes think about 10 and 20. And the most prominent group of genes are P53RB. And the chromatin modifiers are the next group that has a very unique role and are also mutually exclusive with P53RB, MYC, and PIP kinase mutation. So we have some work to do. So what are we missing again? How do we study chromatin remodeling? 
so here we go to a new frontier, what I think sort of a fourth dimension in our understanding of human biology of tumors. And it is, first we knew DNA string, then we knew there was RNA, then we knew the protein, and now we have to look at how it's all regulated, how our cells and our kidney and our bladder and our skin are the same DNA content. We don't think about it most of the time. Why do they make completely different proteins? Why they respond completely different to drugs? If we treat the patient with asthma with glucocorticoids, the asthma gets better because his immune systems die, but there's some other cells that are going to actually grow in response to glucocorticoids. So here is, um, since I joined Gordon Havia's laboratory, it became clear that perhaps the way to go about it is looking at chromatin by um, technique developed quite a few years ago, but now used very extensively in our labs and others, and it's called DNA's hypersensitivity um, mapping. As I mentioned to you, DNA does not exist naked. Therefore, it is protected by the histones, which is wrapped around each one of the DNA, make those meters and meters DNA to fit into 10 nanomolar nuclei. But it also at the site where um, nucleosomes are open, and as I mentioned, chromatin remodelers help to push them around a little bit, we have DNA binding proteins. And that's where the transcriptional um, activation occurs. So regions more hypersensitive to DNAs, it's been known for a long time, are promoters, but also enhancers. So this is a whole new field because even when we do sequencing, most of the laboratories, as the studies I showed you before, have done exome sequencing. They will not touch enhancers. We don't know what is there, out there, untouched, unless we look for it. And there are very few techniques which we can use to look at those regions of DNA that are not encoding a specific product. So enhancers are different kinds, and we're just going to call them for today enhancers. So each cell type has a unique profile of a landscape. And so cells in our body, in our brain, in our lung, in our bladder have completely different chromatin landscape. And they have different regions of DNA hypersensitivity, mostly because they make different proteins and they're prepared to do different functions and different responses. So the, the, I'm not going to go in great detail how the DNA hypersensitivity uh, is performed, but basically exposure to enzyme like DNAs, there are a variety of other uh, DNAs or enzymes that can cut similarly, but uh, for practical purposes, I'm just going to describe DNAs one. Um, it cuts this region, and of course this particular region in the middle, which is more open, is going to be cut in many, many, many pieces. The regions that are a little flanking will be cut in a little less pieces. And what we do uh, is to collect all the pieces and um, collect them, do a sucrose gradient, and do massive parallel sequencing. So now we have lots of little pieces and fewer bigger pieces, and they overlap the entire genome. We can, after sequencing, we can actually align the entire genetic information onto the genome. Um, and this is some of the quality control data that we do before sending for sequencing. So this is how it pretty much looks. We have lots of small pieces um, and fewer larger pieces. And then we can align it and make what we call the tag density map. So now we have regions of DNA that are cut frequently and regions that are not cut at all or cut very seldom. The exposure to DNAs is for three minutes. Other enzymes require similar or slightly different timing, but it's really, really short because if we let it sit with the DNA for a long period of time, it's going to cut everything. So then it's no longer a hypersensitive site. So over 100,000 DNA's hypersensitivity sites have identified in um, each cell type. So you can imagine the amount of bioinformatics that is required to 
carry it down to digest it to understand what is the minimal necessary um, components. And I will show you a little bit of that. So these sites identify all active components, whether they are involved in direct transcription of um, DNA or not, it is a material. If it is active or become active for whatever reason, we're going to see it. So in one single lane of sequencing, we have so much material that we would never have it in any other type of assay. So here is an example. Here is a cells exposed to glucocorticoid dexamethasone and without dexamethasone. And you see there's a one site that appears. It's a uh, new site. It appears after the response to dexamethasone. And it appears only in mammary cell line and not in pituitary cell line. They both respond to glucocorticoid by other means. They pretty much have different ways to respond to it. And so this gene can be regulated at this site in this cell, but the same gene may be regulated at a different site in the different cell. And so all the way to prove that this is of any importance is to do CHIP, that is the chromatin immunoprecipitation assay, where we can look directly whether the glucocorticoid receptor bound to one of these sites that are open. And sure enough, it bound to one single site. These are constitutively open sites. They have nothing to do with glucocorticoid response. And this site, only in this cell type, bound to response. So this is, gives us a little bit of idea that this assay works. We can really um, at least follow the, um, the DNA's hypersensitivity and distinguish the constitutively open site from sites that are truly active and change it over time. So we decided to set up our bearing to look at tumor progression because now we have a way to start with the same cell and follow the same cell, or pretty much the same cell, along uh, tumor progression. And it is important, as I mentioned to you, otherwise we need hundreds of tumors to make sense of one stage and the next stage. So before we do that, this is what we did. We picked up a cell line that is um, called T24, developed by Dan Tedoresco in Colorado. And it is, grows in tissue culture really well. It's developed from a female patient with muscle invasive grade 3 bladder cancer, but it doesn't grow in mice. So they keep putting it in mice and kept putting it in mice, culturing in vitro and putting it in mice. And finally, one mouse grew a tumor. So now we had low tumorogenic low metastatic potential cell line. And that is, from that, they took the cells and they injected them into intravenously. And they injected it into the spleen. And by cells going directly into the lung, or getting through the spleen, migrating into the liver, now we had a cell line that was targeted to either lung or the liver. And by multiple reinjection of this, of the cells, now we had cells that exclusively went either to lung or to liver. So these are FLT3 from the uh, lung and uh, spleen and liver phenotype uh, that went only to the liver. And I'm not going to give you much detail, but this is how the lung looks like after single injection of the uh, FLT3. That is a third passage to the lung, and this is third passage to the liver. So now we have metastatic to the lung and metastatic to the liver. Now, these has all started with one single cell type. So we know that this is now we're talking about metastatic progression. Um, I'll concentrate on analysis of these three um, that was complex enough to show you some of the data. So they were selected in vivo, and that's another important uh, issue, that we did not culture them in vitro. They were all selected by passaging to mice, and they maintained some of their characteristics. And how about mutations? Did they acquire new mutations? First of all, what they had. They have things that we've already seen. They have EP300. They have FGF3, FGF receptor 3. They have HIVRS. They have KDM6A and multiple um, methylation chromatin remodelers and P53. L is his loss of heterogeneity. 
of the wild type uh, leaf, and this is a homozygote loss, like for this CDK and 2B. So similar to tumors that I showed you in large panel of studies, they're good representation of what we expected to see. And how about subclonal? Did they acquire a huge number of mutations? No. They acquire additional two chromatin remodeler gene modifications. And that is very interesting. And they only showed up in the um, um, P24. And then there wasn't much change between liver and lung. So what is different between those two tumor types? Um, so what we going to look at is this T24T versus the two metastatic potential cells. And after we look at these hundreds and hundreds and thousands of DNA's hypersensitivity sites, we concentrated on um, this number of DNA's hypersensitivity that were consistent among from experiment to experiment and unique, or at least different, from the others. And 13,000 were unique to parental cell line with overlap to the uh, long metastatic or liver metastatic. I don't want you to look at numbers, but just look at sort of a gestalt of this whole slide. If you see that lung and liver metastatic cell have a very large overlapping DNA's hypersensitivity sites, while these are quite distinct among them. And all three of them have about 6,000 DNA's hypersensitivity sites that are overlapped. So the other thing that we could do is to look at those sites and see who are they in the genome. Are they in a promoter? Are they an enhancer? Remember, we were talking that promoters are supposedly more sensitive to DNA's hypersensitivity. Well, surprise, surprise, the majority of those sites are not in the promoter. They are in the enhancer. So that whole huge genome space occupied by enhancers is a very large space where DNA's hypersensitivity occurs very frequently and much more frequently, except for this um, long phenotype. It is much more frequent in the, um, in the other cell type. So we'll go and I'll show you some of the examples. How does DNA's hypersensitivity looks like? So here is an um, example of a locus of histocompatibility um, complex where you see that the parental cell line uh, disappears to of the site. Here is also a, uh, uh, from ENCODE database, there is a um, um, information on methylation of histone H3 as well as um, histone H3, 27 acetylation, and histone and methylation 1. So you can see those are very active areas of gene regulation by both methylation as well as DNA's hypersensitivity. This is another example of uh, DNA damage response enzyme, DDB2. And that is also, we don't need DNA damage response, right? We, we want to suppress it, maybe, in the, uh, in the metastatic phenotype. And uh, TNF, interestingly enough, uh, TNF appears mostly in the liver, and it's sort of unique. That whole pathway is very busy in the liver phenotype, as in liver have induced some inflammatory response. And the um, FAM159 and few others are unique for the lung phenotype. So there are unique sites. Just want to give you an example. And there are some common sites. Some sites disappear and appear. OK, so how do we actually put it all together? Now it's a piece of puzzle that I put it um, uh, separately. But one of the ways that we wanted to do is that can we correlate the DNA's hypersensitivity with the um, DNA gene expression by microarray? Can we help microarray analysis by putting first this vast number of genes that are modified or in the vicinity of those mass, vast number of genes, there are modifications, and correlate with microarray? Because by itself, microarray is not giving us much of an answer. So what we did was adapted ingenuity pathway to analyze this data. And we're putting into it 
all DNA's hypersensitivity sites accounting for all the genes within 50 KB of each DNA's hypersensitivity site. So there are multiple genes that could be modified within this distance of the DNA's hypersensitivity. So we have number of genes that could fall into that category. So we can identify biological pathways by uh, progression to metastatic phenotype by merging this DNA's one hypersensitivity by microarray uh, by ingenuity pathway. So this is the data. I, I don't want to do it in too much details, but basically when we take DNA's hypersensitivity just by itself and feed it into the program and say, tell me, what do you think about this 20, 30,000 sites or 20, 30,000 genes that are potentially involved just by detecting the chromatin modification? This is what we come with, and that was a real surprise. Because in, when we compare long metastatic phenotype to its parental cell line, cancer evasion came with the highest score of p-value, whatever, and long hyperplasia came the second. So from all the literature that has been published out there, and the thousand and thousand genes that were fed into the program, it says there's something wrong with the lung. I didn't tell them. They, the machine, the, the program came with the, with the response that lung hyperplasia is number one, and there were adenocarcinoma and carcinoma, and at the bottom of the list, also lung cancer. But that what came with a very high score. How about liver uh, metastatic uh, cell compared to its own, it actually should have P24T, I apologize, compared to its own parental. First, higher score, urogenital cancer. Second, higher score, GI and liver. And within GI or liver group, specifically liver inflammation, hepatocellular carcinoma, et cetera. For some reason, love your neighbor, perhaps, the liver metastatic cells became more like liver and expressed more liver-like genes that were modified in that group of thousands and thousands of genes whose enhancers were uh, in the vicinity of, that, of those genes. So um, this is the, um, also the, when we look at the network through IPA score, and that's the two highest IPA score, respiratory disease for uh, the lung metastasis, and cancer and inflammation in the uh, liver uh, metastatic cell line. We've done much better with this than we do with microarray. Now, we have microarray for all the cell lines, and so this is what microarray shows. Affymetrix, top pathways, the usual players in cancer. doesn't tell us anything about bladder cancer or where the metastasis come from. Cell-to-cell -cell signaling, cancer, cellular development, DNA replication, recombination and repair. So here's what I'm trying to tell you is that perhaps we have an opportunity to have a better diagnostic and response prediction tool using this enhancer region and DNA's hypersensitivity region if we use them properly, if we really understand how to manipulate them. So um, this is one example of the um, the network that I show you, what are the genes the uh, IP identifies within our thousands of genes that we feed into it that are significantly modified in their enhancer region? And uh, in the center of this is MEC and uh, ERK2, ERK1 and 2, but it's the whole group of genes that is interesting that they would pick it up out of this mirage of things that we, we given it to to the uh, program. And so what happens if we overlay just this gene with gene expression? And look what happened. The majority of these genes have changes in gene expression, and quite profound changes in gene expression. Although we're looking just at enhancers, I forgot to mention to you. I'm not even feeding into the promoters. I'm just looking at enhancers. Anything that is in distance beyond 2.5 KB from transcription site size. And the majority of them are change expression. So this is very exciting. 
uh, for us to see that there is correlation with gene expression, that we're looking at the right pattern of modification of the genes that probably are important for progression of tumor, human tumors. So the conclusions from all of this is that chromatin remodeling enzyme have emerged as a major group of genes involved in cancer by itself. They, we could probably call them the new driver type. And uh, they specifically emerge in, uh, in cancers that don't have the known driver mutations. Well, they might be driver by themselves. And DNA hypersensitivity can be specifically useful in analysis of tumor progression because we know where we start from so we can subtract the new things and can identify specific transcription factor binding motif. I didn't tell you, but we could do deep sequencing to look at the actual fingerprint in those regions that are digested by DNA. So we can really see the entire sequence there precisely. Perhaps we can look at drug response because then we can look at before and after the drug and see what is changes and predict is this going to be a good drug to treat this patient or not. And um, the most important thing that our lab is now work, working about right now is the diagnostic extension potential to have uh, like a signature of DNA's hypersensitivity site, which we can pair to other tumors and see what did this tumor predict is it going to be a good responder, or is it going to be a, a very aggressive tumor? Um, so the cell lines have been very useful because they allow us sort of unbiased analysis of DNA's hypersensitivity, and the network gene involved by DHS correlate with expression data. So the last thing I want to add to is that one of our lab members who just left a minute ago is involved in using human biopsies from bladder cancer, also from prostate and other urogenital um, cancers to do this type of analysis because we have novel technology that allows us to use very few cells um, and that is using transposase rather than using the DNA um, as an enzyme, as a marker. But the idea is there and we're working very hard. So thank you for your attention and this is Gordon Hager's lab, which I'm a happy member and hoping to do my favorite game at some point, which is pharmacogenomics, epigenomics. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Lupa. That was very exciting. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the excellent review. You mentioned the uh, that the high nutrition rate in the uterine cancer and the bladder cancer. So there are similarities of the anatomy. You have the epithelial cell, you have the muscle cell, except one of them is full of uh, liquid fluid urine, and the other is occasionally built up with some of the slough tissue. Uh, yeah, what's the question? <laughs> the question is, is the same reason responsible for the hypermutation of these two tissues? Um, it's very likely. It's very likely. It's the exposure to, to uh, carcinogens and the time that it, it is exposed to. And we know that in, even in tissue culture, we can expose to carcinogen for a short period of time. It's not going to do anything. But if we keep it for a while, it's really going to damage the DNA. And the other question you mentioned is the DNA hypersensitive site. You looked at the enhancer region. Is this DNA hypersensitive site is present in all segments of DNA of a particular gene? Um, the profile, the landscape of hypersensitivity, which you, if you take 100,000 sites, are completely different among each cell in the body. And also you started with the human tissue, and then you went into the mouse. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. All mammalian cells have the same pattern of hypersensitivity, same number of hypersensitive sites, but they are all over. Because if you think about it, our cells do different things. They respond different ways to drugs and to, to the toxins. Um, they have different function. And in order to use the same DNA to perform different function, they have this regulatory kind of mechanism of chromatin remodeling. 
but you should see well of things in human samples you are collecting right now. These high degree of hyper mutations. Same. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. A lot of that data is available on the NCOR database. <coughs> A lot of that just set up to combine all of this information. Right. person of my vintage will have eaten a lot of pills and a lot of food that will put uh, metabolites into the bladder. Is there any information on the, uh, whether there are significant mutagens amongst those? Andre, I'm going to defer it to you. Um, well, we know, we know certain <laughs> chemicals. We know certain chemicals are definitely more likely to cause. Well, I mean, stuff that we take in terms of wires. So we have not found that other drugs, there There was um, a belief that some anti-diabetic drugs may cause bladder cancer, um, and uh, there's been large studies now that are still inconclusive about that, and this is still being debated in courtrooms. And, including and the metabolites that we, that we not know Most of these are the metabolites that are in the urine, right. And like it's not the actual drug itself. Yeah, it's you do a name test on, on, on stuff, things like that? Um, potentially. I want to add something very interesting. Andrea mentioned that the ratio of male to female um, bladder cancer, 3 to 1, um, in the past we used to think that that ratio is because male are exposed to aniline dyes and other industrial toxins. However, the dyes have been taken out. The women are working in the factory just as well as men do, and the ratio stays. Interestingly enough, two of the most frequently mutated chromatin remodelers are on chromosome X. So the males don't have the protection of the other chromosomes. And that might be the missing link of the gender difference in bladder cancer, at least accounting for some of it. So I read someplace that one of the mutations that was found is in a glutathione transferase in the uh, bladder wall. Now this gets back to the question you were asking because I mean, this is the major non-oxidative uh, drug metabolizing system. And if there are mutations in it, that, is it really true that they lead to susceptibility, or is that just an erroneous report? Um, so um, this is the perfect person to answer this. Oh. Introduce yourself, Ludmila. So, uh, my name is Ludmila Prokunina Olsen, and I'm working on germline genetics of bladder cancer. And through genome-wide association studies, it has been shown that all three systems which are providing detoxification of any um, like potential carcinogens. So it's GSTM system, it's NAT system, and it's a um, glucuronidation, so UGTs. So all of them have genetic variants which increase susceptibility to bladder cancer. So because we consume, we uh, drink, we eat, we smoke, and everything has to be detoxified and removed. And if you have genetic variants, not somatic, but germline, <coughs> heritable genetic variants in any of these systems, you have increased or decreased risk of blood cancer. So does it answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Is GST pi one of these? Yeah, GSTM1 uh, yeah. is a, it's a very, very significant yeah. risk of blood cancer. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the hour is late. Thank you very, very much. It was a very exciting afternoon. <laughs>